Matt, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. Harassing you on Twitter for the last couple of weeks to, to come on and talk Elon. People, uh, people want me to come on their show when Elon does a lot of stuff, but that's when I have to write a lot of I, stuff. I believe that. Thankfully, uh, we've we've got a fairly quiet Elon week, so I appreciate you doing this. It's a little eerie. Yeah. I'm not yeah. writing tomorrow, so something's going to happen. It's ominous. Yeah, exactly. So maybe, maybe for folks that don't know, uh, you have written a newsletter at Bloomberg for how long now? 12 years? I've been at Bloomberg for about eight years, and the newsletter probably didn't start right away, but... I don't know, six, seven years. Plus or minus. And you took a very uh, normal path to doing that. You were valedictorian of Harvard. Not exactly. Very high at your class at Harvard. Yeah. Uh, Then you taught Latin for a year. I did. Then you went to Yale Law School. Yep. Then you went to Wachtell. Yeah. And then you went to Goldman. Yeah. Very normal path into having a newsletter, writing, journalist, all that stuff. It's a very normal path in the sense that like, if you get a classics degree, you go to law school because there's nothing else to do. And if you go to law school and you do well, you go to Wachtell because it's like the number one firm in the prestige rankings. And if you're a M&A lawyer in like 2007, you're like, ah, oh, I should be in finance. And then Goldman is a sort of natural, like, you know, it's like very obvious, like prestige career moves. And you took that, the path of like, uh, like just the next logical step. Kind of the default, the yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, I joke that I didn't make a uh, decision for myself until I was like 24 years old. I just sort of followed a path ahead of me that other people had done that seemed successful. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, I was, I was just thinking that I, I, um, I gave a talk at, at actually Yale Law School and they asked about my career decisions and I was like, I only actually made one career decision. Right? Yeah. Like I sort of did the normal thing. And then one day at Goldman, I was like, I'm going to be, go be a financial blogger. And that was a strange decision, but everything else was pretty straightforward. How old were you at the time? <sighs> The early thirties, early thirties. And you just, were you, were you, what was the thought process then that you were going to go be a, uh, a blogger? Well, I didn't want to do it anymore. And so didn't want to do Goldman. Yeah. I had like vaguely imagined being a writer and, you know, I was like a person who had an office job and I sat at a desk reading like fun internet writing of the like, you know, two thousands. And so I sort of thought, this looks like fun internet writing. So yeah. I, I was like, this is like Gawker. Yeah. Like Gawker and, and like deal breaker, deal which breaker, was, you know, like yeah. the sort of early deal breaker was, was fabulous. Um, and, uh, but certainly like Gawker and the Gawker, you know, offshoots. Um, and I was like, that looks really fun. And I had vaguely imagined being a writer, but I had no idea what that meant. You know, I like thought of myself as one day being a writer, but like, I didn't like, I wasn't like writing a novel at night. And, uh, I also really didn't like being an investment banker anymore. And I didn't have a lot of responsibilities and I was saving a lot of money. And I was like, I'm going to stop doing this and spend like a year finding myself. And I actually tried to do that. I like went to my boss and I was like, I'm going to quit. And he's like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know, find what, figure out what I'm going to do. And he's like, don't quit now. Like, go take a leave of absence. And so I went back to my desk and like, he was like, just work a few more weeks and then you can take a leave of absence. And then like deal breaker was hiring and I was like, Oh, I should do that. And so I, I, uh, a combination of not wanting to be a banker anymore and like the vaguest of dreams about being a writer, I, I left for Dilbert. The, co- the confluence of those two things. I, were, where were you in your personal life at that point? Did you have, you didn't have kids. Did you have a wife? Uh, I was living with the woman who's now my wife. Yeah. Who did not have kids. Was she, a dog. was she saying like, or you're out of your mind or was she um, supportive? Like what was the, the support group around you? Parents or, or siblings or wife, uh, soon to be wife. What was the reaction that I'm going to go be a blogger? Uh, you know, like it was kind of clear that I was not happy banking and also not like really cut out for it. And so she did want me to like figure something out. I think that like her rational, uh, suggestion was, why don't you try like blogging on the side to see if you're any good at it before you quit your job to do it full time when you've never done it. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But I just, I'm tired when I come home. And so I'm just going to do it and see what happens. Um, I think she was skeptical, but she didn't, she was supportive. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you were at Deal Breaker for like two years, two years. Mm-hmm. And, and what was, take me through like what you st- set out to go do originally. You know, I had no idea. Right. Like I sort of liked internet writing and sort of vaguely, you know, I didn't really know what journalism was like, and like, you know, sort of early two thousand like two thousands blogs like conflated these things, but there's like, you know, there's like breaking news and going out and getting sources and sure. getting scoops and stuff like that. And then there's like typing your thoughts in a box, right? And clearly now my career is like typing my thoughts in a box and I try not to break news. 
but like I didn't know, I didn't like really have a clear sense of that distinction in my mind, and and Dealbreaker did not like enforce that distinction. So I was like, I'm going to go be like a swashbuckling journalist and also like make really good jokes. And you know, Dealbreaker at the time was was run, was like a, essentially a solo project of Best Levin, who's this like genius writer of like comedy. And so I was like, I'll write jokes like Bess. And you know, like I sort of didn't know what I was going to do, but I sort of there are models on the internet of what writing looked like. And then I did it and over time sort of like figured out what I was actually good at. And how, how long did it take you to land on the voice that we, we know today uh, that comes out in the Bloomberg writing? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I want to say that like by like six months or so after starting at Dealbreaker, I was writing like myself. And like early on, I was not. I was like very yeah, much yeah, putting on a Trying post. to be someone else. Um, it felt more natural after about six months, but I think that the sort of the voice has evolved over time. And, and, uh, I, even like, you know, now I go back like five years and, you know, I've been doing this in some form for like 11 years now, I go back like five years and I'm like, Oh, this is like very different. Like, it doesn't sound like me. So. Yeah. so you did that. And did you have a newsletter at the time that you were uh, publishing to, or is it just going on the website? It was just kind of on the website. Dealbreaker was like a real blog. Um, like in, a way that has like been rendered more difficult by sort of social media and people's changing media consumption habits. Like I think of like the email newsletter as being kind of the successor to sort of classic blogging and that like it's, it's like associated with, with a person's voice and it has mul multiple top, multiple like items yeah, in sure. a day and you like go visit it every day. In my case, it comes to your email, but like, you know, old school deal worker, like you go to the website every day and I think that's harder to do on a web-based blog now, and now it's like the newsletter is like the way to get that relationship. The evolution of it, yeah. yeah. And, and so why do you think, uh, so I assume if if six months in, you started to feel like your yourself- Started to, yeah. Started to feel like at least some version of the product we have today. What, were you just following your own interests of like what you found interesting, or yeah. how were you picking what to write, write about? I mean, it's mostly that, but it's also like just sort of, you know, uh, a sense of, like particularly now with the newsletter, like it goes out every day, and so like, you have to write something every day and you know the format is you have to write multiple things every day for the most part and so there's just like a sort of like just necessity component too yeah like you sort of write about the big news that's in finance um but no most it's mostly it's just sort of what is interesting to me and it's like part of like the like finding my voice aspect is like you type what is interesting to you and you hope people read it and then like if you do that enough times and enough people read it, you're like, oh, like what is interesting to me like resonates with people, and so it's okay for me to pursue my interests. I always, I always like, even now, like I'm surprised by the extent to which, like, when I write something really, like, you know, I was a when I was at Goldman, I was an equity derivatives banker, and like I did these like very niche like corporate equity derivatives trades that like, like no one like there's no like media about them, no one yeah, writes yeah. about them, they're not interesting, but like. Every so often, you know, like Tesla got in a fight with JP Morgan over one of these trades. And I was like, well, this is what I did for a living. I got to write about this in a sort of like, you know, in the weeds kind of way. And people love that stuff. Like, it's always like, it's always surprising to me that people are interested in like the more arcane, like weird niche interests of mine, as well as like me writing about, you know, Elon buying Twitter. The internet's uh, remarkable in that regard, like the ability to have things that are seemingly niche. I mean, for better and for worse, right? But uh, if you have niche interests, it turns out a lot of people have niche interests as well that'll follow along with that. Yeah, I think there's like a, um, in like mainstream financial journalism, there's a sort of like bias that people are not interested in like technicalities and the weeds and like complicated products and like just the mechanics of things and like, uh, I feel like that bias is wrong and it's like, it's a nice opportunity for me because I get to write about those things in a place with relatively little competition. Yeah. It, it seems like your tone is, is kind of general amusement with all the machinations. Like it's, sure. it's not really the same cynicism that comes across. And I think that's what resonates with finance people or legal people or whoever it is that I don't know the majority of your followers, but is yeah, that, I don't know either by, by the way, but like it's a lot of tech people. And I think of, I think of a lot of tech people as having the same, like, like it's people who like, like structures and mechanics and like complication, like for, as a, as a sort of like intellectual puzzle and like, as like an aesthetic appreciation. And so, yeah, it's like, like I was a derivative structure and I wasn't like, 
you know, an evil person trying to put one over on my clients. And I also wasn't like, oh, this is evil, you know? And I wasn't like, oh, this is good. This is yeah. like saving the world. I was like, this is interesting. You know? yeah. like, it's just like, you know, you're doing complicated, interesting structures and trying to solve puzzles. And that was appealing to me. And it felt appealing to a lot of people that I worked with and just in the financial industry generally. Like, you just like, you know, across the industry, you see a lot of people who like, it's clear that their interest is in like solving puzzles. And that sort of like amused, like intellectual interest in things is, uh, I don't know, it's like underrepresented in like, you know, media about finance. And so it's like something that I can do. Was being a lawyer or uh, working on derivatives uh, at an investment bank, like, I, I feel like you do a really good job of um, distilling down co seemingly complex things to layman's terms. I remember going back and reading your, uh, a couple weeks ago, the Luna Terra oh, thing. Yeah. And uh, one of your bullet points in the whole thing was like, if you can convince anyone that this is worth anything, then you're in business, yeah. right? And it was explaining this very niche stable coin concept in a way that made a lot of sense. Was that, was that something that came naturally to you growing up? Was it something that you refined at, uh, as a banker or a lawyer in terms of being able to explain these things in kind of a simple way? Yeah. I mean, I think it is something that you learn in those jobs where you're like a specialist, but like, particularly like when I was a derivatives banker, like you're building like sort of complicated, you know, like you're talking to like the quants who are like building the, the models for your like things. And they're like talking about like, you know, option Greeks and like look back features and things. And then like you leave that room and you go talk to the client who's like, you know, like reasonably financially sophisticated. It's like a CFO of a company, but it's not someone who's interested in derivatives, right? Or who cares about option Greeks. And you're trying to tell them a story that is, uh, that is like, that like has some like economic, like, intuition to it and that is just like appealing in a sort of straightforward simple way um and so that sort of thing of like translating the like weird mechanics of the product into something that you can tell someone that is like a compelling story was quite hard for me at the time like as i just like yeah going and pitching it to clients but like it turned out to be good practice for what i do now yeah yeah it's interesting I, I i struggle at times with um the altitude at which to talk about things right so i'll spend time talking about different venture things and all people will tell me oh you're why explain that everyone knows that and i'm like yeah. well no a lot of people don't actually know that and so it's kind of depends on who the audience is um, yeah. i mean i definitely find like as i as, as i as time goes by i get more interested in explaining things at a like a higher level of generality um, where it's less like this is how like this clause of the contract works and like more like this is the broad economic intuition for it. And it's like, you mentioned Luna, like, like I write too much about crypto and like people get mad because they're like right about, you know, real stuff. But I do love crypto because it's like, it, it's this like lab for like financial intuitions, you know, where like, uh, like, like what, like what is Luna reinventing, right? Like something, like yeah. it's not like, it's not like a concept that came from outer space. Like it's, it's like putting together pieces of previous financial innovations and then like throwing it on the blockchain. And if you can like describe the economic intuitions of it, it's like, um, first of all, you know, not to invest in it, but secondly, like, uh, it's just like, I don't know. It's like, it's, it's, it's interesting to, ex for explaining concepts. Like yeah. a lot of crypto, like I'm not that interested in like, who's getting rich on it but like as a way to like understand the sort of deeper financial concepts like crypto is, is like so often great for that well it's like we're going through uh, one of my buddies jokes that it, it's like we have a bunch of engineers learning financial regulations for the first time yeah. like over the course of you know all this stuff that happened in the 20s 30s 40s or yeah. whatever we're sort yeah. of going through it in the wild west right now of crypto um, I want I want to go there in a second, but so so you were at Deal Breaker and then went over to Bloomberg. What was that? What was the thought process uh, at that point? Uh, you know, Bloomberg has a bigger platform and I've a heard bigger of it. bigger budget, and yeah. Uh, yeah, you've heard of it. Like, yeah. it's nice to. Like, I don't call people a lot to be like, "Hi, I'm a reporter," you know. But like, I do occasionally email people to be like, "Hey, I read for Bloomberg," and and it's it's a lot more helpful to say that than to say I read for Deal Breaker. Yeah. Um. And 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 like you know the the terminal readership the, the readers of the Bloomberg terminal are good right like you have a, a good audience like you have a lot of 
Smart people. Yeah, are, captive that are in the. I hope they're not captive. Well, yeah. Like they're, yeah, they're, they're like, there. You're, like you sort they're of there. You have the distribution. Out to smart readers. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you did you ever think through different monetization models? Like once you came over, did you say, "Hey, I, I want this to be free and broad in distribution," or did you think through doing a subscription paid newsletter at some point? I mean, conditional on Bloomberg writing me a paycheck. I want as much distribution, distribution as, as possible. broad as possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so I would rather, you know, right now it's free on the, on the, the, the email newsletter is free. And then like the web version is like part of the general Bloomberg paywall. Yeah. And if they came to me in tomorrow and said, we'd like to take it out from behind the paywall, I'd be like, great, that's fabulous. Yeah. Um, but if they cut my salary, I wouldn't. So. <laughs> <laughs> everything, everything has a price, I guess. Yeah. Um, so what's your, uh, so, so what's your writing process? I mean, you're pretty prolific in your ability to put out, uh, stuff. How do you, how do you go through, you know, determining this? Uh, there's not really a process. Like I wake up and panic and just try to sort of type. Um, it's, 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 it's very sort of underorganized. Like in my perfect world, I would, you know, write from five in the morning until, you know, 11 and then publish the thing at noon. And then in the afternoon sort of get ready for the following day's newsletter. But in practice, all of those things slip a lot. You know, part of it is just like my process is now increasingly like, hanging out with my kids in the morning. So it's like everything slips later in the day and gets harder to uh, prepare for the following day. But it's, it's very much panic based. You know, I sort of like read the web, flag some things that I want to write about and then like kind of figure out what I'm going to say mostly by writing and occasionally by walking around the house or whatever. How do you, how do you determine what's, what's actually interesting? I assume you've gotten pretty good feedback loops over the, the years of readers responding to things. And how, how do you think about like what to, what to go into? I mean, it's, it's mostly just literally what I find aesthetically interesting. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's also, it's very much things where I feel like I have, uh, some sort of distinctive value add where like, I don't want to, I feel like a lot of people are really good about writing about the Fed and I I have no special knowledge of the Fed. And so I'm just not going to write about the Fed. Right. Um, but like if there's some, if there's some weird niche element of like crypto or of, you know, equity derivatives or whatever that people aren't writing about, or like, you know, like I write a lot about Elon's takeover of Twitter. I was an M and A lawyer for a little while. Yeah. Right? And there are not a lot of M and A lawyers like writing on the web about Elon's sort of thing. And there are a lot of people writing like wrong things about, you know, whether he can get out of the deal or like just sort of like basic mechanics of it. And like people, you know, I, I don't write a lot about like the mechanics of like, you know, like M and a deal certainty because like no one cares except now they care. Right. Yeah. So it's like, it's been fun for me. Um, but no, it's like mostly it's like things where I think I have some sort of specialized knowledge or just like a perspective that, uh, that is not sort of not the thing that everyone else is writing. Yeah. So. Interesting. Um, and when you say just pay attention to the internet, is it, uh, is it Twitter that you're monitoring? Is it all different news sources? Like it used to be like much more, much better about my RSS feed. Now my RSS, it's like, I don't know. It's just like, it stopped being the way that people consume news, but it, you know, it's like Twitter, but it's all, it's mostly just like, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I write about is stuff that's on like the homepage of Bloomberg and the front page of the wall street journal. Like, I don't know, like Today I wrote about uh, this like insider trading case and in, in NFTs and like like twenty people sent me that being like in case you missed it I'm like no, I didn't miss. like that's like that yeah. that gets to me you know? yeah yeah um, but uh, uh, yeah no, it's a lot of like sort of it's it's rare for me to to like write about really arcane things that like aren't covered elsewhere and when that does happen it's most often people emailing it to me yeah directly like people being like you should check this out yeah. Interesting. So, um, I guess, uh, well, in terms of all the success you had now, are you, are are there, are there groupies that are coming up and stopping you on the subway? Like what is the recognition level like today? Yeah. Like I would say that I'm recognized like, you know, a few times a year, a few times a year, really not like, not like every day. Oh, interesting. I, uh, maybe like once a month. I don't know. Yeah. something Something like that. Yeah. That's the right ballpark. I assume this, these are M and A lawyers or, or investment banking associates, or, uh, I guess venture capitalists kind of coming up to you and yeah, it's like, you know, it's like finance bros in midtown. It's lawyers. Uh, I was, I was at brunch on the Upper West side with my, with my parents a few weeks ago and I was, 
it's like an outdoor brunch, and I was recognized by a, a young lawyer. <laughs> My parents were were very puzzled by that. Yeah, that's funny. I uh, I have to I have to imagine. Hopefully, probably the amount of times you are recognized, I would hope that your readership is. Uh, not the not the groupie type to uh, go up and stop you and uh, you know try to get a selfie or something, but maybe that. Happens. I don't really mind that. I mean, like I'm I'm like not so famous that that's like intrusive, you know. Wait like, till this podcast airs, yeah, sure, you know. Sure, yeah. yeah. Shifting gears a little bit, um, so you wrote a lot about the Wall Street bets and meme stocks and GameStop and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, now we've had a significant market pullback here uh, over the course of the last whatever four months. What, what do you think? Um, what do you think happens as a offshoot of all of that stuff? Like when we're looking back five, ten, fifty years from now, of all of those things that went on, do you think this is a blip in financial history? Do you think it marks meaningful regulatory change? What, what do you think the output of all this is? I don't know. I think that Wall Street bets. I think meme stocks is probably the thing that I've written about that I understand the least. Like where I feel like least confident in my views. Um, just because of the, it, it's like a whole bunch of social dynamics yeah. and yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I mean, like, first of all, I would put GameStop in like a context of like, I think I've written this like, like 10 years ago, if you said like, what is a stock worth? You'd be like, Oh, discounted cash flows. You know, like you'd like, you'd have some notion of like underlying fundamental value. Right. And like, then, like, you come along and people, and you're like, well, what's a Bitcoin worth? And and people tell, like, these fundamental stories, right? Yeah. But, like, essentially the story of, like, what a Bitcoin is worth is, like, if it is broadly socially adopted as as a store of value, then it's a very valuable store of value. And if it's not, like, it doesn't, like, generate cash, right? It's just, like, a, it's like an entry on a computer ledger. Um, and, you know, there was, like, seven five seven years where like bitcoin was like sort of you know in news stories and people were like this is worthless this is all a bubble that's going to go to zero and i think people say that now like some people do i guess but like i don't think people really are like oh bitcoin like crypto is going to zero right so like you have this thing it's like quite large class of financial assets that like are purely about or almost purely about or essentially about just like social adoption, just yeah. people saying we ascribe value to these things so they have value and in like a way that is like pretty robust. And like, that's a huge change. I mean, it's not entirely in the sense that like you could say something similar about like gold, right? Yeah, the, but like that was a long time ago yeah, when gold yeah. became valuable, right? Yeah. Like, like you don't see a lot of things that that has happened to in the same way in the last, you know, 200 years or whatever. Um, and, uh, and like that's a big sort of change in outlook. And like I think to some extent, GameStop is a uh, like meme stocks are a um, offshoot of that, where people are like, well, if like if like what makes things valuable is essentially like groups of people on the internet describing value to them, then like why not GameStop, right? Um, like why can't we just get together in a chat room and make a stock go up? And why like why is that less legitimate than? any other reason any stock would go up. I think that's part of it. I don't think that's all of it, right? I think there's a lot of like distrust of like the financial system and other things that went into it. But like that dynamic, um, like maybe that like bubble, that like that conceptual bubble has popped, but I don't really think so, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. like crypto is still here. I'm um, like NFTs, like I think there's there's been like a, like that sort of meme driven value creation, like some of the air has gone out of that, yeah. but it's not gone, you know? Um, so I think that's the biggest, like, like sort of long term change. And I don't think it's about GameStop, but I think GameStop is a symptom of it. Um, regulatory stuff. I don't know. It doesn't seem to be anyone's priority to prevent a repeat of GameStop. You know, if you're like, oh, we're going to go from like T plus two to T plus one settlement, which is yeah, not, yeah. like it's sort of an irrelevancy. I don't think, I mean, I, you know, I think that like, uh, the view of regulators is that bubbles happen and like. You 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 want to make the system robust to those bubbles, which I don't think. I don't think there's any systemic risk from GameStop, right? So you make the system robust to those bubbles, and then people can you know make their own semi-informed decisions. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. What um what about uh, I guess another topic you write about is uh, material non-public information and insider trading sure. and 
uh, you wrote today about it in the context of uh, of NFTs and the the guy that was an employee of OpenSea front running um, things as they were posted to the website. What does insider trading even mean these days? Is it is it kind of an arbitrary thing that gets uh, litigated in? Case by no, case. I mean, I think there's like a, I think there is a sort of technical meaning that people don't find necessarily intuitive, but that leaving aside the open sea thing, I think it's, you know, I like to say it's, it's, it's trading on material, non-public information, like information that matters to a stock or whatever, and that uh, is not generally public that you got in a bad way. Right. And like, it's like fairly well defined what in a bad way means. Like, if you are an executive of the company and you're trading on that company's information, like you have a fiduciary duty not to do that. If you're like an investment banker of the company or like the therapist of an executive of the company, you have some obligation to like the company or the insiders or whatever, not to, uh, not to use their information for your own purposes. And, uh, if you hack into the company's servers or like the, uh, you know, the press wire service servers and you steal the information, that's also a bad way. And that counts. So like, you know, if you like got it in a way that like was nefarious and you trade on it, that's insider trading. And it's a st- and if it's a stock. Now, the open sea thing is interesting because it's not a stock. And the prosecutors are taking the view that basically any sort of insider trading on material non public information about anything that you misappropriated from someone. If you had some duty of confidentiality and you traded on that confidential information, you know, not just the stock, but like commodity, non-fungible token, uh, real estate, anything, that's wire fraud. And so that's like a very broad expansion of insider trading. Whether they win with that and whether they uh, they pursue that into other areas, I don't know, right? I mean, like there's, there's a story a few years back when like Amazon was gonna, t- gonna open an HQ2 in New York yeah, yeah. and uh, like in Queens, I think. And, uh, and like some people bought up like, you know, real estate around where the headquarters are gonna be. And there's a lot of talk about that being insider trading and you know, under the, the open sea theory, that would be a crime too, even though it's not a securities crime. So I don't know. Uh, I do think that like, like the courts and the SEC have like a reasonably clear and consistent understanding of what insider trading is. But then I think a lot of the cases that are brought are sort of like unintuitive. Yeah. So, mm. yeah just because you bring up crypto, you had a funny uh, quote in an interview that I saw. You said, uh, I think DeFi is really cool, but actual uh ventures makes me want to shoot myself that's how stuff works though 90 percent fraud 10 percent innovation you said the you said the the ones who get into this space and succeed get rich and the ones who get into this space and fail get hilariously rich do you think like does web3 as we sort of talk about and crypto and all this stuff do, do you view this as having a staying power that you know is going to persist beyond you know because it's kind of reached this flywheel and does that pertain just to bitcoin or is it nfts where do you where do you think like on the spectrum of all this stuff we are and what's going to stay i mean i come from like the financial world and a lot of DeFi seems to be about sort of rebuilding a like like a like a financial system like a sort of system for like trading financial assets and like margining financial assets and whatever in a way that is in some ways more kind of like like sort of like refactored from like the way that you know just sort of like build it from the ground up in a way that is sort of like logical and uh and sort of open access and uh and like cool for nerds you know like like it's yeah. a lot of you know it's people being like, if i you know it's a lot of like the people who are like sort of programmers at traditional financial firms being like if i were rebuilding the system from the ground up how would i do it in a way that is like very like neat and intuitive and i find that appealing right like i'm like a financial nerd like i'm like oh that's cool like that's like i think that like some amount of it is done in a way that like uh devalues like certain like real world, real world things about like, you know, like, like the way that like the way the financial system works where there's some amount of like, like the, like the biggest thing is that there is this belief that like smart contracts code is law, like everything will, you know, work exactly as coded. And like, you never have to go to court and say, well, what we really meant was this, right? And like as a former lawyer, like, I don't buy yeah, that, yeah. right? But I think there's like some germ of like a, of like an intuition that like you could build a 
sort of more decentralized automated financial system, that would be cool, you know? And because it is cool, it attracts a lot of like smart people who, who like who come from traditional finance firms and who would rather build something kind of from the ground up that is more like appealing intellectually. Um, so I think that like nothing real happens, you know, like yeah. it, it, every time I say it, like people go, Oh, there's one th- real thing over here, but like, it feels like not a lot real is happening, but like in terms of building of infrastructure for trading, like it's cool. And so like eventually we'll, we'll trade some real stuff on it. Right. Like, yeah. So I don't know. I think there's some staying power there. I'm not, but a, that market cap might be 10 billion or I have no 50 idea. billion. Versus... I have no idea. I mean, I don't like market cap. I feel like is, is almost the wrong metric, right? I mean, like if you can move like the trading of stocks to like some sort of, decentralized some sort of system that looks more like crypto right whether exactly what, like, whether it's on the blockchain or what i don't know but like something that looks more like what crypto people are thinking about than something that looks like what nicey currently does then that would be i don't know what like the market cap of that coin would be right but like you know the market cap of the stock market is enormous, yeah right? there'd be utility in that you also did an interview with uh sam bankman fried on odd lots yeah, yeah. podcast recently and uh he was i would say fairly cynical in his portrayal of uh yield farming specifically but also just his tone around all this stuff was was uh more negative than i think i would have expected for someone that's running one of the bigger crypto uh important crypto companies out there were you were you surprised that uh like his tone and what he said about see i didn't experience it that way i feel bad like i got to sam backman for in trouble but no i um you know like you mentioned like my tone of sort of like amused like yeah indulgence of like financial stuff like i like first of all that's how i took him and secondly like he is a person who i think of as like being interested in like the intellectual like puzzle solving aspect of finance and like to some extent like you sort of bracket what a coin is for, what a what a crypto coin is for and you say like well you know this is like the mechanics of how money goes in and out and like when you say that in a in a certain amused way on a podcast to me, and I'm like, so it's a Ponzi, like he like is like it could be a Ponzi, right? So I think that he was like under, he was um, giving very short shrift to the utility of some of like of like the tokens that are used in yield farming because it was not relevant to the particular set of puzzles we were talking about. But like, but the, I don't mean that he like like deep down believes that these things are saving the world. Like, I think he is like a guy interested in solving intellectual puzzles and like, you know, his, like his whole public posture is interesting, right? Because he's a, uh, he, he's, he's like making a lot of money running crypto to like write checks to effective altruism organizations. And like, you know, you don't have to believe in the underlying crypto to, to take their money. Oh yeah. Um, he, but he, he did, it did sort of feel like he was saying the quiet part out loud a little bit, uh, from, and maybe it was just, I, I know it was one part of a much longer interview, but, uh, but it was, it was interesting that he, um, even he wasn't trying to frame oh, it. At but a I, different I way. just think that like, I just think that like, if you were to describe yield farming as like, you start this coin that like solves poverty and then you like stake it, right? Like, it's like, like yeah. Like that's you a can't lie. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whole, like you start a coin that's a box. Yes, and then you stake it, and like more money comes out of the box. Listen, like, I found it. <laughs> I found it refreshing, uh, and I I was amused at it because you know one of the smartest people thinking about this stuff you know, said it the way that I don't know. I would I would jokingly kind of. But again, like it. I mean, the other thing I'd say is that like you know what I said about Bitcoin is like is like the sort of like centerpiece of a lot of this, which is that like the social acceptance of the value of these things drives the value of these totally. things in a, in a, in a naked way, right. Where it's not like, it's not like intermediated through like, well, it has cash flows. It's just like people accept it. It's, it's valuable. Right. And so like, that's like the premise of so many of these things, right. Yeah. It's the premise of Luna. It's the premise of yield farming, right? Like if you start from it having some value, then like you can build a lot of stuff off of it. And if you ask, why does it have some value? In the abstract, the answer is, ah, it doesn't, yeah. right? But like, that's just in the abstract, right? Like an individual project, you might be able to tell a better story, right? I mean, or you might not. I don't know. What about Elon? How, do, how does uh, someone you've written about quite a bit and someone that skirted, uh, you know, some of the SEC um, regulations and, and disclosures and all that, how do you think this Twitter thing ends for him from here? You've written that, you know, he can't really get out of it, right? Yeah, I, 
I hate to speculate on this because like I think it will close and he will pay fifty four twenty a share for Twitter and like and like it doesn't seem that controversial to me, right? Like he hasn't said that he won't really ever, but certainly not in like the last week or two, right? Yeah. Um like he's he implied that he wouldn't, you know, that was a while ago and he's gone quiet and like moved on to other things and talked about how he's gonna own Twitter and like keeps like you know, doing the filings and doing, you know, proceeding with all the steps that required that are required to get the deal closed. And like, you know, there's no like regulatory impediment. The shareholders are going to vote. Yes. Like he has the money. Like it's fine. It was going to close this deal. But like it's trading at like 40 bucks a share. Totally. And a lot of people don't believe it's right. going to close. Just and I don't fully understand why, but like their money is on the line. So like I assume that they have some reason i just i don't and i don't understand it if you listen to his tone when uh when the all-in guys were interviewing him at their their conference i mean his tone would say and again this is one of those things if do you take elon literally or do you take him you know uh directionally in what he's saying but his tone and how he was talking about this definitely didn't seem like he intended to close now it sounds like they're yeah i mean my assumption is that he was sort of like 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 clearly like at that time, like clearly he was overpaying, right? Yeah. Like he, he put in a price that looked sort of like, right, like good enough to get the board interested, but like not wildly overpaying. And then like, you know, the market collapsed and like Tesla collapsed. Yeah. So like his, he has less money than he did. And so now it feels like he's overpaying. And so he sort of like, like, it seems to me that he floated a trial balloon of like, can I get away with talking some shit about Twitter and renegotiating the price? And it does feel like the answer was no, right? Where like, like people like me went on the internet to be like, no. And like Twitter was like, no. And so like, you know, like I could be totally wrong. And he could be like, we're going to litigate this to the death and I will destroy Twitter unless they renegotiate it down to 45 bucks or, or I will walk away, you know? Um, but like my impression from like him stirring this shit up for like 24 hours and then dropping it is that it was sort of a trial balloon of like, can I get out of this? And the answer is kind of no. And then he dropped it. But I, 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 I cannot look into the man's head. Like I have no idea. So yeah. Yeah. How, how do you think all this sec stuff, uh, plays out for him? I, I, you know, like he like very brazenly violated a number of like, not very important rules yes. is the answer. Right. Like, which is unfortunate, but like, like I think, like they've, they've sent him a letter being like, why did you violate all these rules? And they will eventually send him a settlement agreement and he will maybe sign it. And it will be like, he has to pay them some money and it will probably be a very, very, very large fine relative to historical fines for violating these rules. And very, very small relative to like Elon Musk's net worth or yeah. like the price of Twitter or anything like that. Like they're not going to block him from like being a public They're not, not going to like arrest him, you yeah. know? Like, so it's just like, like, cause it's not that bad. And like, if it were anyone else, it wouldn't be that bad. And like, because he's like smirking while doing it and because he's constantly picking fights with the SEC, like it's very annoying, but like, it's just not that bad. Are you amused by it? Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. I got mad one day, but like for the most part. Yeah. Like it's annoying. Like, you know, like as a former lawyer, I was like, you know, like I, I, one likes the rule of law, right? Yeah, like, yeah. It would be nice. And like, it's weird because like, like there are people who are like, oh, billionaires can get away with anything. But like, in fact, billionaires have lawyers. And like, if you are very, very rich, it just doesn't make sense for you to fill out this form late. Like you, you have enough money to hire lawyers and not fill out the form late. And you, for the most part, like very rich people, like like a public perception of them that is like this is a upstanding, respectable citizen. Like this is a really like a good guy, right? Like Elon Musk doesn't care, right? And like he likes the perception of him that is like this is a guy who breaks the law a little yeah. bit, and like that's very annoying. I don't know. Do you uh, do you think that this everything he's done is he one of one in the same way that? I don't know. Trump, Donald Trump seems to be one of one in terms of uh, elements of their fandom and their approach to running a company in politics. Or do you think this has permanently changed um, corporate governance and g going forward for other other CEOs, other board members? I, I think people draw lessons from him. Um, yeah, I'm I'm interested to know like what other uh, 
what like the next sort of like private equity M and A agreement looks like. Like whether the breakup fees will be much bigger. You know, like like the like he signed an agreement that like looks like it should be pretty good. Like it should give Twitter a lot of comfort that he can't get out of it. But like they're squirming, right? So like the next 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 person selling a company is going to sign an even tighter agreement, right? Yeah. Um, but probably terms, even higher breakup fee. Yeah. But in terms of like how companies are run, like I, I, I think that um, his like really full time devotion to his persona is hard to replicate. But like I do think people are drawing lessons in terms of like I think like like the one thing I would, I would say is like you know like I think that a lot of CEOs you know five years ago would have said like social media is like a pure downside risk. Like I can like get myself in trouble on Twitter, but I'm not going to like you know. Change the stock improve the fortunes really of my yeah. company by tweeting, right? And then you look at like Elon Musk, you're like, oh yeah, I could have like, you know, raised billions of dollars of equity at an enormous valuation by like having a fan base on Twitter. And I think people are, I think it is very hard to be Elon Musk, but I think if you look at like, you know, like Adam Aaron at at, uh, at AMC is the sort of classic example of like a guy who's like, you know, Harvard College, Harvard Business School, like sort of straightforward business executive who's like, I'm going to be a character on Twitter yeah. because that seems to be helpful for my stock price and for my ability to like raise financing. And like it's worked out, right? Yeah. And like he's not Elon Musk, but he's like, like I think there are, there are lessons that people, you know, beyond him are learning from Elon Musk. Certainly interesting. I, I guess as you look back over all of these things that you've sort of written about over the course of the last, whatever, couple of years since the pandemic, uh, since the pandemic occurred, was there anything that you just found totally unexpected and completely changed your mind on uh, having seen all these different machinations play out? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, 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 I mean, GameStop just blew my mind. Like, yeah, it really. It's like the thing I don't understand. Like, I in in from a social dynamic standpoint, or just like throwing away the fundamental value yeah, like, of like, what things are worth. Like the ability of um, retail investors to get together and dramatically move the price of a stock uh, for a long time. I had read like you know the, the year previous to that. Like I had read. There's like a Business Week cover story about uh, like Wall Street bets, and it quoted people being saying that like if you buy call options, you can like make the stock of the price the, the price of a stock go up. And I was like, yeah, sure, but like not really. Like, the, yeah, the retail people buying call options is not really going to move the stock. You have to organize thousands and thousands yeah. of people willing to risk all their money. Like, like the stock market is sort of like about institutional flows, and like your your like you know Robinhood account just isn't going to have an effect on that. And then, like, no, I was wrong, right? Yeah. Like, like, you know, GameStop just, or, you know, the Wall Street bets just ran over, like, giant hedge funds in GameStop. And uh, and I wrote, and I, people kept throwing this book back at me for, like, still, you know, and, like, you know, like, the first week of February of, of, of like, uh, of 2021, like, you know, a week after the big GameStop uh blow up you know the stock is at like i don't know 150 or whatever and i was like i tell you what if we're still here in a month i'm going to freak out and we were there for like a year like and it's still like it's still you know up you know a thousand percent from where it was uh, at the beginning of january 2021 right um and like the fundamentals might be better but like it's mostly you know like like the the staying power of like the meme stock effect on a stock is is just really striking to me yeah and, and uh and I guess the impact it's actually had on the financial system for, I mean, you know, Melvin last week. Yeah. I don't think the impact on the financial system is that big, right? I mean, Melvin blew up, right? Yeah. Like there's one hedge fund blew up, but I don't like, the like people want there to be like systemic risks and like, you know, like Robin Hood had like a problem with its clearing broker. Sure. You know, with yeah, its, yeah. With its, that like, whole conspiracy. Collateral. Yeah. Right. So people have a lot of conspiracy theories. And I think that like some of them were people on Wall Street bets would be like, the financial system almost crashed in January yeah, 21 yeah. because of, because but like of, not really, but not really. We went right? from like, T like, minus two to, you yeah, know, yeah, it's like, it's like, um, it's, it's not like, it's not like the world almost ended. It's just like my mental model of how stock prices work. Uh, it doesn't work anymore. Well, it didn't bring down the financial system, but I have to imagine, I mean, I, I've, I've talked to friends that, that work at hedge funds, like the, the, the risk appetite to go short sure. on stocks is right. very different today, or at least the consideration set of like, this wasn't a nuclear option that was even in people's right. frameworks right. Right. at all. Right. Like, because again, like you, like the idea that 
some retail traders can move the price of a stock 10x and keep it there for as long as they want is is just not a thing that you would have thought. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, it's almost in some ways a manifestation. I know people compare Elon a, a lot to Donald Trump, but uh, there there's clearly things that are true in the world uh, that aren't necessarily reported in a meaningful way to the same extent that um, they've proven out, right? If you're just looking at the probabilities of these things happening, it would be almost negligible, right? But then they, then they happen. Yeah. Uh, Last one is there uh, is there anything that you've written about that um, we've probably forgotten about, but you still think is really interesting uh, and might manifest itself or show up at some point in the future again, and you y- you still think about it in a meaningful way? No, I mean the things I like that I don't that that I feel like I don't talk about enough are like um, you know complicated structured traditional finance trades, like just like you know like one day like. I started my career as a journal, as a whatever I do, as a blogger, in 2011, which is a great time because uh, you're getting fallout from the financial crisis. And so all these like um, really complicated trades that were not like the guts of them were not made public. Like it wasn't like you got a prospectus that said this is how like these, you know, synthetic CDOs worked. Like they were being made public in like post crisis, like yeah, litigation yeah. and prosecutions and stuff. It's like the really Pentagon fun. Papers of yeah, yeah, finance. It was really fun, and uh, and then that sort of like that 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 sort of like died down, and now like I'm hopeful that there are other like complicated horrors that are like lurking in a bank somewhere that like I will one day read about in litigation. But right now, I feel like there's there's less of that and more like crypto blowups. I the odds are statistically that stuff mm-hmm. is probably going on deep in the the uh, parts of these financial institutions. So I trust you'll ha- you'll have a long long time to have this market. Yeah. Uh, anything that we didn't hit? I don't think so. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. 